welcome to this very first episode of Insightfully Speaking, a brand new podcast from Cardec Group. I'm Adam Osborne, and along with my co-hosts, Annie Sinclair and Umberto Schubert, we'll be talking about recent news, events, books, films, and anything interesting that catches our eye. Each episode will be joined by two special guests, bringing their thoughts and insights as we look at the world from a spiritist perspective. Our special guests this episode are Charles Kempf from France and Dana Sisi from America. Now, we know that there might be some people listening or watching who haven't heard of spiritism before, or don't know much about it. Spiritism is a philosophical and scientific way of looking at life from all aspects of life, death, what happens before, after, and everything in between. Spiritism believes in the core principles that we are all brothers and sisters within humanity, that we are all capable of progress, that there is an afterlife, that reincarnation exists, and that there is a logical reason for everything. Spiritism was formalised in the 1850s by a French educator who used the pen name Allan Kardec, who published many insightful books such as The Spirits Book. Anyone can study Spiritism, and there are Spiritist study groups all around the world. If you want to know more about Spiritism, please contact us and we'll be more than happy to help. So let's get started with the show. Annie, Umberto, hello to you both. How has 2021 been for you so far? Hello, it's been interesting. Life is always interesting. It depends on how you look at it. Hello, fellows. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, the year has been quite interesting and also challenging. I only hope it is uh, less challenging than the last year. Yes, absolutely. I think 2020 was such an eventful year for everyone all around the world. But do you think that 2021 will be a lot better? It's, well, it's difficult to predict uh, what, you, what do you mean by better, really, that's, that's the question. So like Umberto said, it's been challenging, uh, but um, it's been different, it's been unexpected, it's uh, been a surprise. When yeah, a year ago we started off, I remember back in March, and there was talk, you know, of the of the pandemic in in Italy, in China, in Spain, and here in in England we were thinking, yeah, that's happening over there. It's not happening to us. And then a couple of weeks later, we went to lockdown, and we've been in and out of lockdown for a year now. And I don't think any of us ever thought that this is how it was going to play out. So it was a completely uncharted, unexpected uh, situation, at least for me. And I think for a lot of my colleagues and friends, maybe some other people might have had more insight, but it, it, we were not expecting that year to go like that. And this year, now we are prepared that anything can happen. Well, um, quoting uh, great philosophers and also the band Alphaville, we hope for the best, but we have to expect the worst. Uh, this is uh, basic wisdom about life. We have to be prepared for everything. We know that uh, unexpected challenges may happen, may come to us, but uh, we may never give up hope because hope is also a rational effort uh, in the direction of improvement, of progress. And uh, we should never give up of being happy and of achieving happiness, of pursuing happiness. And happiness involves progress, improvement. Uh, so uh, it is not a matter of faith only, but also a matter of um, uh, rational mental health uh, uh, struggle to to be sane and and to be uh, well uh, that we should believe in uh, something better in in some form of improvement. 
Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. So let's bring on our two guests for this month. Uh, Dan, Charles, hello, both of you. How are you? And how has 2021 been for you so far? Hello, everyone. Pleasure to have you, um, you know, have a chance to be here with you. Well, 2020 has been um, an incredible year, a very different year. And 2021 started out very traumatic as well for us, for us out here in the U.S. with lots of uh, news, lots of different things happening. Um, but, you know, as I take stock of this, uh, this past year and what 21 brings us, it seems like we're starting to settle into a different way of thinking in a life. So I'm, I'm remaining positive uh, about it. I am uh, taking stock of all the changes that have happened in our lives. And in my life, particularly, it has afforded me, even in the middle of all this mayhem of all these things, it has afforded me a lot more time with my family. It has afforded more time for reflection. So there have been silver linings in the middle of this crazy, great pandemic that we're living in. So um, you know, I am, I am, I'm, I'm trying to make a heads of tail of it all. And so ask me that question again at the end of this year. I think that will be a, a, a very different perspective than the one we have right now. So, uh, Indeed, 2020 was a surprise, huh? uh, unexpected, not a lot of discussion, everyone with a little bit fear, so applying the rules correctly. And then we started to see some reactions, some good reactions, some not so good reactions. Huh? It's a kind of a revealing of who is really who. For me, it started quite uh, difficultly because uh, my mother uh, passed away. Uh, we don't know if it was COVID, but it was exactly the same symptom uh, just before the confinement. She has been freed uh, from uh, uh, her physical body uh, with 90, almost 92 years old. Okay, so I think uh, I first would like uh, also to, to, to share the, the, the pain of everyone who has uh, lost uh, loved uh, uh, ones. Huh? And it's a lot. Huh? It's two and a half million uh, over the world uh, so far. And also uh, thoughts for all these person who have lost uh, their uh, work and have no mean uh, of, uh, of uh, earning uh, the necessary uh, for their life. So a lot of difficulties uh, are appearing. Uh, but uh, how to say, I'm, I'm really confident because uh, positive reaction existed. I think an awareness, there are still some people fighting against and uh, uh, how to say uh, in the streets and uh, not agreed and don't want to give up a little bit of uh, their freedom to respect simply the freedom of the, of the next one. And this is exactly where uh, our spiritist teaching are helping us a lot because uh, the situation can be difficult but once once you see as you told adam at the beginning where we come from where we are and where we go to with knowing this in a rational way and not just a dogmatic you have to believe because it's written or whatsoever no we believe because we have understood because we have evidences and so on and this gives us huge resources to face it uh, and even now in 2021, uh, uh, there are variants coming and uh, I'm sure of, there are also some hopes like vaccine. Uh, I think, uh, but I think it's not the end. It's just a kind of a small exercise to prepare us for maybe something who I don't want to be pessimistic, but uh, how to say to gradually uh, make us solid and robust enough uh, to face uh, even stronger things. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I was going to ask because I feel that many people were very eager to see the end of 2020. Do you think they were right or perhaps have, were people too enthusiastic for 2021 to start? If I can just say, you know, uh, sometimes um, we are worried about the past and we are worried about the future, but we forget about the present. And uh, we are in the present and we are thinking that this is an opportunity to live fully in the present. For the past has already gone, we can't change it. The future, we don't know. Uh, but the present is where we are and we are living. So as you said, lots of people were in a big hurry to get the year over so because next year will be better. 
But how will next year be better if we are not better ourselves? Uh, of course, we have, uh, you know, uh, optimistic thoughts about a vaccine and things improving. But I take it back to the point of what has this pandemic come to teach us? This has been uh, an event of global proportions. It has uh, shaken everybody in every country from every social class, uh, the young and the old. Everybody's been affected in different ways. Uh, some uh, feeling the pain more than others, of course, always. But it's knocked on everybody's door. So if we don't take time to think, what is this pandemic teaching me? We will have this lesson come back to us sometime again in the future. Because the, the pandemic or whatever difficult situations come our way, they're not a punishment. They're a lesson to help us to move forwards, to help us to find our inner resources, to come out of our comfort zone and look at ourselves in a slightly different way and to take on the challenge. So rather than wishing it away, I feel that uh, it's more useful for us to totally engage with it and totally feel the pain, but also feel the, the process that can help us to, to progress uh, so that we can fully learn the lesson so that we don't need to go through this experience again. And so rather than wishing it all away, let's actually live it and experience it. That's, that, that's uh, what, what I was thinking about it. I don't know if others agree. Yeah, sorry, I, I was going to jump in. I think, I think those are words of wisdom. I think that, uh, you know, 2020 taught us many different things. And I think one of them, it has re, um, reinstilled in us the certainty that we are creatures of comfort. Um, that we just really want to go back to the way it was before. So I think this desire for 2020 to end really is emblem uh, 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 emblematic of the fact that we just wanted to go back to doing things the way we were too, right? We're really cr creatures of comfort. And it's understandable. It's understandable. But I think your point, Anne, uh, brings a great question to us is, should we, should we, should we really go back to the way we were? And I think that's the uh, the fundamental reflection question for me as I think about 2021 is, you know what? The world pre-2020 wasn't as great as it could be either. So I don't know if I want to go back to the way it was. I, I would want to make it a better place. Yeah. And, you know, definitely this pandemic is still going on around the world we know that the country's struggling while others are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel Vac vaccinations against covid have already started and the levels of, of infection are starting to drop quite dramatically in various countries here in the uk we know that the government has set an estimated deadline for lifting all social distancing regulations by the end of june but what kind of impact has there been on our lives? What lessons have we learned? What lessons have we perhaps missed? So, Umberto, what kind of, what's been the biggest impact on your life because of the pandemic? Well, I, I would like to come back to the previous question because uh, Stoic uh, philosophers said, or they believe that it was irrational and actually futile to complain about nature, to complain about reality. So uh, it, to the extent that we cannot do anything about that, we just uh, have to accept things uh, as they are, exactly as they are. And uh, as much as we can do something about it, then we should or we are morally uh, inclined to do something uh, about it. So we have to measure how much of the situation is in our hands and we can actually change and how much of the situation is completely outside our, our range, our personal or even our collective uh, capacity to deal uh, with, with the situation. So uh, the first thing I think we, we should um, uh, invest time on is uh, on acceptance, on uh, arranging our own feelings 
to uh, adapt to the situation as it is more realistically as possible um, about me personally uh, well um, it's hard to say that because it has been a horrible time for many but it was a very productive time and I had more time with my family with my children and I could not complain about it I am a public employee uh, which is a great privilege in, in this time. And I was, uh, as far as I can tell, not affected by the situation. So uh, for the many that are in this uh, position, I think we have to exercise our gratitude to the privilege of being so. The biggest impact is, I would say, the... I was used to travel quite frequently for uh, spiritist activities and all of a sudden, no travel anymore. But uh, luckily, we had already some uh, virtual uh, meetings and tools and so on. Luckily, as well, the technology has developed uh, tremendously quick. And today, the, where I was giving, I would say, two or three lectures uh, before the pandemic, Today, I give uh, five times more. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the effect of the pandemics has uh, maybe blocked some of the activities for which we could not adapt ourselves yet uh, to have them virtual. But all what we could do virtual, it has, in the opposite way, developed a lot. And uh, so this is, uh, I don't, I think uh, Umberto told about, huh? uh, the, 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 it, it asked us an effort to adapt ourselves to this new reality. And uh, this is, I mean, there is a lot of people have also always a difficulty, resistance for change, and it is natural, it is normal, it is uh, comprehensible. But on another hand, uh, on my side, uh, the, 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 to change is a challenge and it's really motivating uh, because we, we find, again, I told it already at the beginning, in, into the Spiritist teachings, huge resources uh, to first to accept the reality, to try to understand and analyze uh, quietly uh, with the time we have uh, to react in the best possible way, and also strengths uh, to adapt to this new reality. Uh, and uh, 2021, in, in this way, is a kind of uh, uh, say, revealing who is who, uh, and uh, even, even helping us and myself to uh, know myself better, uh, which is also something fundamental, as Anne told at the beginning. Uh, okay, today I'm working. What shall I do best uh, for ensuring my best uh, tomorrow and to adapt to this? And as I told, uh, uh, Dan also thanks a lot. Huh? Everyone, a lot of people would like to start like before. I'm convinced that uh, it will never be anymore like before and that we will have to adapt. But uh, seeing it positively, we will adapt it in, in having it better tomorrow than it was yesterday. So it's really no panic, no reason. Of course, uh, a lot of people are, uh, have huge difficulties and so on, uh, more or less uh, uh, affected by what's happening. But again, we have uh, to see it as an opportunity to improve our tomorrow. Yeah. And so we know, like we were saying, many things have had to change because of this pandemic. And so from for all of you, what, how have your spiritist activities actually changed in this past year? And do you think that will be the permanent way forward? Dan? Um, you know, I think that Charles said some things that really resonated with me. I think that, um, you know, of course, life has completely changed, right, in terms of, of behavior, um, attitudes, and so forth in many different ways. When it comes to, to spiritist activities, I, I mean, I haven't been in a plane since, I think, February or March of, 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 um, of last year, right? And I used to get on a plane quite frequently for a variety of reasons, so... That was no doubt a big, um, a big change. And I don't mean getting in the planes. I mean getting in the plane to see people, right? So being with people personally and to being in the same room, there's obviously a different energy to it. There's obviously the opportunity to chat with people 
before or after an event, right, and have conversations that normally you wouldn't have on, you know, on the virtual uh, platform with lots of people. So that has definitely changed. And I think that uh, that's something that I miss. But on the other hand, like Charles was saying, you know, we also adapted to do things differently. And we've seen an explosion of online events. So there, there is a good side to it, right? Because I think that if you really want content, I think it's more readily available now. The question that remains, how do you sort through all that content to find something that you like? Right? So I think that's a, a new set of challenges that we were sort of faced with before. It just kind of magnified. Um, and so from a spiritist perspective, I think that's great. But I, I do enjoy the opportunity to talk with people. I think that learning and growing happens best when we are engaging with others like we're doing now and have a chance to, to converse, to ask questions, to learn about different perspectives. Um, so that is nice. But the, but the physical piece, the, the physical being close together and being able to, to feel that energy it's something that 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 I miss miss on the, uh, the on the spiritist front, but you know there's a reason for everything. I think there's a, a great learning moment, uh, like Charles also alluded to. I think that uh, I'm with him. I think that life is not going to be the way we uh, we had it before, nor I think it should. Um, you know, given that we have lots of growing pains, and I love that we recognize here that a lot of people um, have had their lives changed significantly. And in very painful ways, and you know, our heart goes to all of them. Uh, but I think we got to ask ourselves the question: What does it mean for us, um, and as as a group of people? And how how are we going to make the good things stick? How are how are we going to make sense of this new world, and to what end? So, I am I remain cautiously optimistic, right? I, I want to I want to remain optimistic about the changes we we can see in the world. Uh, but I know that I think that we need to be more tolerant of of the cur the current circumstance and know that at least we got I think we got at least until the end of 2021 um, to to kind of figure things out. I was I was thinking, you know, um, uh, at work, we we used to work. I, I work in the hospital, but I work in, the, in an office mainly, although I go to the wards, but my 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 work is computer based. So our team was all sent home back in March uh, to work from home. And this was a novelty. We had to learn to work from home. Uh, and uh, when they did a research to say, okay, when things uh, start improving, do people want to carry on working from home or do you want to come back to the office? So they wanted to do like uh, a survey to see what as employees we were feeling we would like to do. And the majority of us said we would like to have a blended approach. We would like to go to work to the office some days on on certain days and have some days working from home, like have this mixture because there are some positives from working from home. And but there we all missed the social aspect of being in the office with other human beings, of having a coffee and saying, how was your day? Uh, you know, that kind of uh, you took a phone call and then you put it down and say you don't believe what's just happened down on the ward. All that's lost when you're sitting alone at home. So all that interaction. So we said, actually, if we could have our way, we would like to have a mixture of working from home and being in the office. And I think for the spiritist activities, it's the same. I think going forwards, it would be nice to have a mixture that we have opportunity of having encounters like this where people are on different continents. We can all be together on the Internet. But also I miss being in the same room with other people. So we could have a bit of each. And I think that one of the things that's coming through also through all this pandemic and new ways of working and, like I say, this explosion of content of spiritism on the Internet is about separating and um, choosing, you know, what do you want to watch, what do you want to take part in? Because it was sometimes, I think, almost overwhelming, like there was so many talks, so many meetings, so many, much as I said, oh, oh, I need to calm down and just choose fewer things be with uh, wholly in the thing uh, and give myself time to reflect uh, and to think about one thing rather than having this vast uh, quantity of things coming, coming, coming. But, you know, what, are, what, are, what sense am I making of it? How am I digesting it? You know, how, what difference is this making to my life? So that's, that's, where, I, that's where I'm thinking. No, that's ab absolutely true. And even within our own group, we've seen the benefits of doing things online in that people who 
perhaps aren't physically in the area where we, we would be having our meeting are now able to join us. People from other countries, from other time zones. But of course, again, like, you, like you've both been saying, the mass amount of content that's been available, sometimes needing to filter through to find enough to, um, for not, to, not, to not be overwhelmed, absolutely. So what do we think are the key lessons that we as humanity have learned from this pandemic or that we should have learned? Umberto. Well, that's very hard to answer because we are still in, in the middle of the process. Uh, we may have um, or we may need some years to really process and digest what is happening to us and how we changed uh, in, in this time. But, uh, right now, uh, as a philosopher, I like to think that it is a great opportunity to think about the way we are uh, administrating our time, uh, the emphasis we are putting on uh, unnecessary things and aspects of our lives and the time we spend home and uh, also the necessity or even the, the importance of uh, social contact. Uh, and as a Brazilian, I miss uh, social contact and, and close personal contact quite deeply. <laughs> uh, if new words come from this situation, and I'm sure some of them may be created, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that a couple of these words may be in Portuguese, because uh, <laughs> it is um, our culture is, uh, is quite um, social and quite based on uh, personal and even physical contact. And being deprived of that is very weird. It is a very new and strange situation. But uh, as optimists that we are uh, as spiritists, and we have to be, I think uh, we may learn with time to understand, to interpret this situation as a great opportunity to improve, to learn, to acquire more conscience. Yes, I, I fully share uh, Umberto's views. I would even say it's a kind of a training because you see here we are five together. We, we are together in communion of thoughts. Huh? The thoughts are not conditioned by distance for time, delay or nothing. It is here. So it's a kind of a training of uh, what is that, the life in the spiritual world. I don't know if in the spiritual world uh, we can have hugs or not. There must be something similar to that. Uh, I, I fully agree also with Umberto that uh, we are used to since uh, a long time, uh, since we are born uh, to have this uh, presence and physical contact. But uh, is it really absolutely necessary? And uh, in the current conditions, is it really blocking everything? Not at all. Hein? We still can continue. Of course, there is some uh, saudade hein? <laughs> of, of these things, but okay, uh, I think we can live with. And it's, it's uh, also, I think, uh, one big learning is it's a lot of people, even spiritists, hein? they were telling, no, I, I, I hate masks. I don't want to, to bear masks and so on. And then by talking together, it's like, hey, guys, OK, you know that uh, the law of freedom, huh? spirit book, uh, third part and so on. Huh? Uh, we are not free once we are living together. Our freedom is stopping where it jeopardizes the freedom of our, of, of, of our neighbor. Do you like your neighbor to jeopardize your freedom? No. So please don't jeopardize the freedom of your neighbor. And the guy, two days later, he came to me and talked. I have thought about what you have told and now I'm wearing the mask. You see? And, and we, we find in the, in the teachings the resources to, to understand and to, to, to respect more, to, to, to feel better these limits, what we should uh, do and what we should not do. 
And uh, the, the COVID is, is simply here to give us the opportunity to put that in practice. So again, I see it uh, as, as a big opportunity. And I would say if you take 100% of the population, maybe 5% or 2% or 3% have changed. Huh? But it's, it's little, but at least it's, five, it's 2, 3, 5%. And in the next year, it may be 5% more and more and more. And with this, we can see immediately the effect accelerating the evolution and the transition of our planet, clearly. Um, I do take a couple of lessons so far from, from COVID as well um, that I think I ref, you know, reserve the right to, to review later on as, as I get wiser. Um, you know, one of those, I think, that uh, goes to the heart of the matter that Charles was speaking is that we're all connected. I think that we 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 have uh, shown that um, that we we can't just think that we are an island unto ourselves, as you know John Doan, the poet, would have said, right? That what I do affects you, and, and vice versa. And I think that is a paradigm shift for us because I think we always thinking about ourselves, and I think that's a really important lesson that I don't think all of us have gotten just yet, uh, but I think that certainly COVID has exposed to us. I think another one that it's you know, goes to what Charles was saying too, is it's really exposing ourselves to ourselves, right? So we get to really know who we are. And I think the lesson uh, number two that I take from this is that fear still drives us. Fear still drives most of our actions, that we're making our actions uh, uh, out of fear, not necessarily out of proactive uh, thoughtfulness. Um, you know, and I think a third lesson um, that I would take away as well is that we're also learning that nobody wins until everybody wins. Uh, I think that's an important one because there's no way that you can, exp uh, you know, escape the, the pandemic. Uh, there's no guaranteed way that you can do that by yourself. The only way for us to beat that is if all of us wear our masks, because if all of us get our shots, if all of us tackle this together. And I think that's a paradigm shift for us, too, because we, we, we generally think that we are in control of everything. And if only we do the right move, we're going to be OK. And that's how we get ahead. And I think this is a beginning of a of awakening to the fact that we have to think a more communion way. And I think the fourth lesson then um, is that we need to work on our relationships, just like we were talking here. We really need to work and spend time talking to people. Um, but one of the things that have fascinated has been that my personal fifth lesson, and I'll shut up after that, is I think that the most dangerous virus we have is the virus of the mind. Uh, I think that we have shown that we live in very interesting times where information has um, has really been an interesting thing, right? Um, we live in this alternate facts reality where everybody is making their own facts or, or using their confirmation bias, right? Really just holding on to that one idea that suits our, our beliefs and we are no longer living in an objective reality. And I think that's a dangerous thing. We've seen the, the rise of um, conspiracy theories and QAnon and all this kind of thinking that takes you into a parallel world that I think is most dangerous, uh, it's more dangerous than the, the COVID piece itself, because I, I guarantee you we're going to be COVID eventually. But this this idea that there is a secret societies out there to get us and, and, and that other people are always plotting against us or trying to manipulate us, I think that can do us more um, harm uh, into our human relations, right? And I think that we've seen that. And I think that worries me the most is how we're treating each other nowadays. So... Um, if I don't like you, I'm just kind of writing you off or saying that you don't know what you're talking about. And it happens on both sides of the spectrum, right? Um, so so I think these are, are, are things that I've been reflecting on for 2021. And I think there's a lot more lessons in there. But man, have we been shown some interesting things. Have we been held, uh, been told to, help, to hold up a mirror to ourselves and really uh, rethink our, our lives and, and our actions uh, in 2020 with COVID? So, you know, in the long term, it has been a blessing. I think that, you know, whenever you're in, in pain and crisis, you don't see it. But, uh, you know, in, in due time, I think we're going to look back and say, wow, we learned a lot about this. Um, and of course, I could be completely off. I could have a lot more learnings a year from now. And I think 10 years from now, we're going to even see this better than we see now. But it's certainly been a learning period. Yeah. Now, you touched on a very important item there, Dan, because we know that it's not been an easy time for many people and mental health charities have been reporting a huge increase in the number of people who have become stressed, anxious, depressed over this past year, which is you know, totally understandable. 
And luckily, there have been hundreds of initiatives online to help boost our mood from you know, exercise, exercise classes to celebrities making funny videos, yoga groups, meditation groups. And actually, a recent report from Cambridge University has shown that, amongst other things, laughter therapy and mindfulness are valuable tools right now for our mental health. So, Annie, this is a great one for you. What are your thoughts about mindfulness and what is it? Oh, no, I'm no expert, but uh, I have been taught uh, uh, mindfulness um, exercises uh, because during this pandemic, uh, one of the, the, the conditions that a lot of people have been suffering from is anxiety and having your thoughts nonstop and worrying. And you're worrying about what was before, you're worrying about what's going to come and you're worrying about things you have no control over. And so uh, doing mindfulness exercises helps to give you your, your mind a moment to rest from all these thoughts. And I think it's one thing that's really easy to do. I mean, you can use breathing and things like that. But one thing that works really well for me, and uh, which I, I can use at any time if I feel overwhelmed by my thoughts, is to connect to your senses. So you do a mundane job, let's say like the washing up. And then normally if I do the washing up, I do it on automatic pilot. So I'm washing the dishes, but I'm thinking of something else. But when they say mindfulness, it says if you're going to wash the dishes then focus on all your senses. Look at the water, look at the detergent, use your eyes. Feel the sense, is the water hot, cold? How does it feel? How does the, the, the cutlery feel? Use your, your touch. Smell the detergent, smell, what smells can you hear? What's the noise of the water? So you're using all your senses to connect to the, and a very simple event like washing, uh, washing up. And for that moment, because you're, you're concentrating all your thoughts onto your senses, and your, your brain is then um, uh, processing all those senses, it gives you, let's say, a rest from all this uh, thought process for five minutes or so. And then you come back and you, you can sort of start again on a more calm event. Or even if you do like eating a piece of chocolate, you get the piece of chocolate a little, you get a square, feel the chocolate, feel the edges. Uh, is it heavy? Is it, is it light? How does the paper open? What does it smell like? You put it on your tongue. You know, what are the flavors you feel inside? So normally you get a piece of chocolate, you just go chuck, and it's gone. So if you do it in a mindful way, it's an exercise in order just to calm your thoughts and to center you. And that anybody can do that. It's really easy. And even in your busy day, you can take, you know, five minutes to do something in a mindful way. Then that will already be helping to uh, reset you know, sort of in, in the clock to a, a slightly more manageable uh, rhythm, perhaps, to de-accelerate because we are like thinking, 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 going, 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 and just building into this, you know, frenzy of uh, anxiety and worry and everything. So it's, it's a way that's not thinking, it's not rational, but it's using your senses to, to calm it down. I found that it was really useful and interesting for me. It was something I hadn't experienced before. Is there someone here that does not want chocolate now? <laughs> I, I was going to say, you know, it now explains why we're gaining weight during COVID, right? Because we're all being mindful eating chocolate. That's, uh, I'm just getting hungry over here. Thanks, Han. <laughs> Always sharing. <laughs> yeah. But has anyone else tried mindfulness, especially over this past year? Yes. Um, you know, whenever I... I feel like my anxiety is getting the best of me. Um, I try to, to do a 10-minute uh, guided or semi-guided meditation uh, early in the day. I find that um, when I get to it, sometimes I'm so anxious that I, I, I can't get to it, right? Uh, or I think I can't get to it. But when I do, I think it really helps me. And I, I, you know, I, I use different, uh, you, and there's different kinds of apps out there for beginners as well, you know, Headspace, uh, 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 calm and all the kind of things that are very portable that you can kind of carry on your phone. And I find that sometimes I think that's a, just a really great way of kind of recentering uh, and, 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 and kind of taking stock of what's happening. So, so I do. I think every once in a while that, that, that really helps me. Well, um, my, my wife is a yoga teacher 
and she faced a hard time and actually bankruptcy in last April. She had to close her training room and moved uh, her activities to, to the online um, uh, classrooms or online training. Uh, and uh, very quickly she realized that the now as isolated population uh, experienced an increase uh, of demand or, or interest on yoga, which is a sort of mindful uh, physical exercise. Uh, and people now are looking for this sort of activities as a way to cope with the, the reality of uh, absence of uh, interactions, personal contacts, and even uh, contact with nature in, in some cases. Meditation is a wonderful tool and we can find so many references to this throughout all the spiritist works, including works from Andre Louise, from Joanna G. Angelis as well. But another question is, apart from these kinds of activities, what else have has motivated all of you during this past year to keep going, to plod on, to keep calm and carry on? I'll say one of the things that, because I, I am just like everybody else, I have had my difficult days and uh, the days of, like Dan would say, of fear, uh, of when you lose the plot a little bit. But one thing that helps me to carry on every day is the complete conviction that I am an eternal spirit, that I am here on a journey which is a lesson, which is a life, which is this incarnation. But I was before. And I will continue to be as much as everybody else as well. So all my loved ones and everybody who's been here before, who might have already gone back. Uh, and that thought that this will pass, but this is an exercise, this is an experience, this is a journey uh, that we are doing on Earth. Uh, that helps me to have focus that this is not the end of the world nothing is the end of the world as much as the change is so dramatic uh, of our way of our comfort zone and we are being pushed and things but the reality is that i am an eternal spirit and what, whatever happens to me to my loved ones to everybody we will carry on and uh, so that for me is really what gets me up every day and helps me to try and see the beauty in nature the beauty that is everywhere, because amongst the chaos, you can find, you know, where do you put your attention? What do you look at? Do you look at the chaos or can you find something of beauty to cheer you up, to make you feel better? Great. Uh, th this sort of suffering makes us remember uh, the necessity of consolation. And we have uh, philosophical consolations which are drier, but uh, work pretty well for everyone. And we have religious uh, consolations or religious solace, which works uh, probably better, but for those who share the, the belief or the faith. And uh, spiritism is somehow in between these two sorts of uh, offers of consolation. It is spiritual or religious in, in a natural sense of the word, not in an institutional sense of the word. And it is also philosophical. So uh, I think that uh, spiritism may be a very, very powerful tool to interpret and to help understanding reality, and especially human reality, the, the, the meaning of life, as uh, French author Léon Denis said uh, very precisely and uh, as long as we remember that life has to have a meaning and uh, as long as we struggle to to end it and to make sense of it i think uh, we are uh, more capable of dealing with everything yeah 
and it's so important for us to remain positive as much as possible and one person who we've heard of who's been really positive is may willis who's a pensioner from southeast england who will be 111 years old very soon and in a recent bbc news interview which is on the bbc news website she said i can't see the point of grumbling or moaning life's too short make the most of what you've got so what kind of other positive things can we do to, to help us cope with everything that we're going through charles yes thank you for this uh, wonderful example adam also I, I fully agree with Anne and umberto the fear is basically instinctive huh? it is something that uh, uh, it's positive huh, because it's uh, instinct. It's for our preservation. But uh, with the development of the, of our intelligence, uh, we are uh, replacing the fear by uh, anal analyzing the situation, the facts, and facing them. Huh? And uh, the fear is uh, then decreasing. So we have this method for controlling it. Huh? And uh, on another hand. Uh, um, the, the, when this pandemic came, of course, uh, the scientific knowledge on it was very poor. So uh, we, we could just go and analyze uh, with simple facts. Okay, it's uh, transmitted uh, through the hands and we have to wash the hands and so on. Very simple things that we could apply and, and uh, that indeed uh, we did, we did apply. And uh, the, 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 other, the other thing is also looking to the reaction of the people, huh? uh, as it has been told by Dan, also this uh, uh, complotist uh, theories and so on. It's, and, and all this mass of information which is coming to us that we need. The problem is not the access to the information. The problem, the problem is exactly to develop the discernment. I hope this work exists also in English. Huh? To, to do calm, you look, you analyze, uh, for, and, and, and you don't neither uh, denying everything nor believing in everything, but just keep this discernment. And what is incredible is uh, in the spiritist philosophy, we find the basics for understanding the situation, the basics for uh, analyzing the best reactions. And also in, 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 in Kardec's teachings and Leon Denis' teachings, thanks for the quote, Umberto, we find also the method, huh? because uh, how do we behave uh, when we get uh, mediumistic communications? We have to analyze, we have to exert, uh, uh, to, to make this discernment, uh, to, to see what's behind. Uh, is it clear? Is it opportunistic? Is it opportune? Is it uh, useful? And uh, by using, by having these habits in ourselves, of course, then uh, facing uh, all this situation and all this mass of information, it helps. It helps really, really, really a lot. Otherwise, I think we get flooded, and that's that's I think what is dramatic today. Uh, we told about this uh, uh, depression and difficult uh, more, uh, situation, uh, in particular with the young people, and uh, the, our basic action here is exactly to do what we are doing to try to disseminate these teachings huh? because they are maybe not blocked uh, as, as they would be uh, later on, uh, because we can clearly find uh, very strong resources uh, which help us uh, outstandingly. Um, I think that, you know, for me, remaining optimistic touches on all these, these pieces that folks have talked about. And ultimately, it boils down to belief in God, um, you know, and when we have this idea in, that, that we, we, we see really well structured in spiritism and, uh, you know, and shown that, that, there, is a, a, that there, is a, there is a rationale for things, there is a logic for things, and that God is inf infinitely just and kind, uh, we understand that uh, nothing is out of place in many different ways. Uh, it, the difficult piece is living, living our daily lives and lives in this small perspective that we have of just a moment, right? Uh, but when I do think about the, the bigger picture, and I am reminded of these uh, great ideas, beautiful ideas, such as reincarnation and the love of God for us, then I also am reminded that everything that I have ever done 
throughout the ages, throughout many different lives, and, and, and your, you as well, has led us to here and now. And that we've been prepared for this. That we were born in this time and place, and I believe in a God that's kind and just, that will see us through this, will help us uh, make our way through this. Uh, otherwise, it would be a mean God to put us in place where we can't solve the challenges that we face, right? Uh, and that would be no God at all, so we wouldn't have a God. But knowing that there is one, and knowing that we reincarnate and we grow through the times and ages and th things, I, I have to remain hopeful that we are going to tackle this. Um, we might not find the answer that we want, but there will be an answer, there will be a solution. So that keeps me going. Uh, you know, that keeps me uh, focused on the idea that uh, I was literally born for this. We were literally born for this. Uh, we, can, we, can do, we can do this. That's why we're here. We, we can lend a hand to the world in this wonderful time of transition and change. And the question is, what is our role? And what are we willing to do to make that happen? What kind of sacrifices or inputs or efforts are we going to do on an individual level to make the world a better place. So I think that's what keeps me going. It gives me purpose. Uh, it gives me a certainty that things are gonna be well, even though the, the path ahead might be a little bumpy and that we are gonna succeed. So I hold on to that and that takes me through. Yeah, and you mentioned the word sacrifice there. And for me, one core teaching within Spiritism is charity, the need of helping the other. And so I wanted to move now to a slightly sadder note. The British charity icons, Captain Sir Tom Moore, passed away and it was his funeral on Saturday 27th of February. Now, Captain Tom rose to fame in 2020 when, in the build-up to his 100th birthday, he decided to raise money for the British Public Health Service, the NHS, by simply walking around his garden 100 times. Now, many of us will probably think that's quite easy, but we have to remember he was 99 years old and on top of that, he was recovering from a broken hip, a punctured lung, hip replacement, and two knee, knee replacements. His initial target was to raise just £1,000, but he captured the country's heart and ended up raising over £30 million for the NHS. On the Captain Tom Moore Twitter account, they put a quote from him saying, So, even if tomorrow is my last day, if all those I loved are waiting for me, then that tomorrow will be a good day. Captain Sir Tom Moore has been an inspiration to many. He's inspired young kids with cerebral palsy and, prosth and prosthetic legs to work hard with their physiotherapy. He's inspired hundreds of people to do charity walks, raising even more for worthwhile causes. He's inspired people who have been sedentary this past year just to get up and move around. He reached number one in the UK music charts. He was knighted by the Queen. Buses and trains were named after him. And when he passed away, the Houses of Parliament held one minute silence and the nation stood up and applauded him. So how important is it that we acknowledge these charitable people and all the people who have inspired us this past year? A very beautiful story because uh, it shows us very objectively how easy it is to be an inspiration, to be a model, to, to be someone that uh, draws attention for doing something uh, that is, uh, in, in the general uh, view, not very uh, impressive, not, not very remarkable. But uh, in fact, the the fact that it moves us so much is already a proof that uh, there is power in, in this sort of activity, in this sort of gesture. And we can all and we all have in our uh, reach the possibility to touch someone, a friend, a child, uh, someone unknown to us with very simple gestures of dignity of uh, strong effort and continued effort and so on. I think that uh, he really captured uh, the public's imagination because he, when he said uh, with all his restrictions of his physical difficulties, when he thought, what can I do to help the effort of the nation? 
and everybody could think, what can I do to help? And it doesn't matter because, I mean, everybody will do something different to help. But it's the moving and he physically moves. It, it's almost like a, a metaphor to get us moving. And I, I think that that's why it's kind of really everybody bought, uh, sort of was caught up in the in their own imagination, started thinking of things. Well, I I can do something too. If he can do that, I can do something. And he really got people moving. And he did it in just such a humble way that I mean, you know, it it was really interesting. And it gave us hope in the human spirit, in the ability to overcome adversity and to not give up even to your hundredth birthday. You know what I mean? It's people are much younger than that and say, oh, I'm getting old. I can't do this. I can't do that. I moan. And no, it just, you know, yes, your body is, is getting older, but that is no uh, limit for the spirit that you are. It, uh, and I think that that's, that's for me, the, the, the thing that made, made me sort of pay attention to him and everybody. We were all inspired by him for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we really want to hear from anyone who's watching and listening to the show. So please let us know about your stories of who or what has given you inspiration during this pandemic. Has anyone or anything made a notable difference for you, keeping you happy and positive? And what activities have helped you to keep going or have you been inspired to do? So send us your thoughts via the Cardec Group social media channels. You can contact us via Facebook, send us a tweet at Cardec Group, or you can email us at insightfully at cardec.org.uk. And also let us know about any recent news items that you think we should talk about in our next show. And here's something that was submitted for this episode. Is there life on Mars? So for those who have not seen the news recently, the NASA rover Perseverance landed on Mars, ready to start its mission of investigating the red planet, looking out for microbial life. Dan, is there life on other planets? And what does spiritism say about it? Ah, I love that topic. And it's an interesting piece because I think that, um, you know, the key question for, for the key part of that question is, what do we mean by life, right? Because I think we traditionally seek that which is use, uh, which which we're comfortable with, which we are acquainted with, and so we may not find life as we see it uh, here on Earth on Mars. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it may not be life on Mars in a different way. I think that we're also struggling with this question here on Earth, right? We we realize that there's life on Earth. Uh, going on that uh, we oftentimes ignore or are unaware. We, for instance, see that the spiritual world is interacting with us on a daily basis, and we fail to register that as a society most of the time, right? So, uh, so there's life here on Earth that uh, we don't even know about, and it's here. And I think that uh, you know, there's a beautiful quote from that uh, movie Contact and that book Contact. Uh, you might have seen it when. Um, uh, when the little girl's talking to her dad and she looks up and sees it, all of these stars and the beautiful pieces, all, all of it. And, in, and, the, and she asks her dad, do you think that there's life out there? And he stops and pauses and says, you know, I don't know. But if there isn't, wouldn't that be an incredibly uh, waste of space, an incredible <laughs> waste of space, right? Um, and so, so I think that, uh, you know, with, with time, as we are told by our spiritual friends to continue to talk to us and, and give us different kindness, we know that there's life in every planet out there. It just might not resemble the way that we see it. So uh, if we broaden our understanding of life to include spiritual life, then I think the answer is a resounding yes. Um, but I am also hopeful that more and more we are going to find the inklings of life that looks more like ours, right? Be it through the presence of water, be it the presence of the precursors to biological life as we know, gases, uh, you know, microorganisms and the like. So very exciting. I, you know, I had a childhood moment when, a, or a childlike moment when I saw the videos of you know, the rover landing on Mars. And, and just to think of it, oh my goodness, I have lived to the time where I can actually see what the surface of Mars look like. Not through the lens of a science fiction movie or a book, right, or an imagined sketch, but an actual, an actual picture. 
what an incredible feat uh, that has been. And, uh, you know, I think that's a moment to celebrate too, to celebrate the ingenuity of, of science, of our relentless pursuit to learn things and grow things uh, and uh, grow our understanding. So very exciting to see that. I, I do not think to kind of make it a short, uh, short answer that it's not short at all. Um, I, I do not think that, uh, I don't, that we're going to find uh, life as we expect it, like as our own. But I do think that slowly we are going to realize that, there's, that it is teeming with life different kinds of life so we're not going to find the tripods that hg wells talks about in war of the worlds <laughs> i you know it's a good question it's a good question right <laughs> we're going to have to figure it out if uh, um, we are going to find entrance to secret caves in the underworld too with different kinds of beings and uh, no i think that i think that that might not be the that, that might not be in store for us uh, for for the time being umberto what do you think well, this is not a very hard question and a very hard issue, actually. Um, we, we have philosophers now that deny the existence of minds. So they use words, feelings and thoughts and sell lots of books to tell us that minds do not exist. So uh, from the point we are now, to acknowledging uh, the existence of um, spiritual fundamental reality and to be uh, capable of administrating level of relationships with other possible communities around there, I think we are still very, very far away from, from that point. So I would guess that uh, from a purely philosophical point of view, we do not deserve or we are not prepared for uh, more significant contact, but we may found some bacteria somewhere. Meanwhile. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows what we find? Yeah, no, I was thinking because w when uh, I watched also with my family uh, live the in the landing on Mars, and we thought, wow, this is such a technological achievement. And, you know, that moment of tension, you know, will it land, will it uh, break, you know, all this kind of thing. But my thought and uh, it was, I hope it doesn't land on anybody's head. Because, you know, you're sending something there, you don't know, you know, we might not be able to see them. You know, our, our, our vision is limited. So and then I was less comparing. So our human vision has a spectrum. If we are a dog or some other animal, we have a wider spectrum of vision. If we put on, you know, different types of uh, instruments, so if we take a microscope, we can look in and we can see the microscopic world, or we take the telescope, we can. So we have some instruments to enhance our vision, but it's still limited. So it may well be. I thought to myself that there are people who are there, but we just can't see them. And our machine is falling there. And I just thought, I hope it fall, doesn't fall on anybody's head. I mean, I was, I was joking, but I wasn't. Because I think it goes also about the responsibility of where you're going, what are you taking, what's your intention. And I'm all for scientific research and it, it, things like that. But I, it, just saying, it just showed to me uh, while we have this massive technological advancement, also the amount of things that we don't know is infinite. So we are like baby steps of reaching out to the world. But I go totally with what Dan was saying, like, uh, and what is in the Spirits book as well. Do you think that, you know, we are the only people in the universe? This doesn't make any sense at all, just out of, uh, out of statistics and math. It doesn't make sense that, that we are the only people here. And it doesn't make sense. Uh, so if we can't see the spirit world that is here, you know, how? so that is, I'm thinking that we don't, we don't yet have the goggles to see what's go really going on in Mars, if you like. That's my view. And very interestingly enough, um, there are more people willing to accept Martians than there, than there are willing to accept spirits. Yep. Charles, I was going to ask, what do you think Kardec would think about the Mars landing? Well, I think he would be, he, he is uh, very happy about this, clearly. 
because uh, he always uh, was uh, supporting uh, the, the, the science huh, to come and to prove uh, uh, the, 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 all these teachings who have been anticipated uh, by the spirits huh, who helped him in compiling the spirits book. In the spirits book, it's very clear, the plurality of the inhabited worlds was a basic teaching. It, it, it is, uh, how to say, uh, obvious, and it took, you see, 160 years now. Huh? Uh, it's, more, it's now since a little bit more than a decade that we are finding exoplanets huh, with uh, conditions very similar to Earth. And basically, I mean, all the calculations which are done of probability and so on, uh, the probability that there is life similar to our one we have on Earth somewhere else in the universe is big, is very big. So it's something which is already admitted. And I saw on March, clearly, when they were landing on that piece, it, it, is, it was a lake. They have found out already by observation that there was water at a given point in time. Now we are going there just to see if we still can find some additional evidences of those things. Huh? And uh, spiritism is clearly doesn't fear science at all because science is, is discovering and the more science is advancing, what we see, it is co somehow confirming in a certain way uh, all these things uh, who, who were anticipated uh, a, a century ago. And uh, I would just like to add once, just a small story. Uh, I was asked uh, once to make a, to a talk about uh, unidentified flying objects. I was telling, oh my God, <laughs> that's a harsh one. How will I do and manage that? And basically, my talk was about uh, plurality of the inhabited worlds, <laughs> you know. And of course, two or three guys who came to the talk were highly disappointed because they were expecting me to come with the last details about the things filmed during the whole night on the, the hill close to Nice or wherever else to, to see some flash or whatever. <laughs> and they have been a little bit disappointed, of course, because for us, spiritists, uh, we, we, of course, welcome all the researchers, huh? but uh, we, are, we, are, we, we know already. And the spirits, when you talk about spirits, a spirit which does not live on Earth is, by definition, an extraterrestrial, isn't it? I, of course, also fully agree with Umberto, our scientific guys today. Uh, uh, the, 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 the mainstream science is still with a materialistic paradigm. They don't even admit that we have a soul, something independent from the material body, which is the, the source and producing the, the, the mind and intelligence. They think we are just governed by uh, random uh, biochemical reactions. Bon, it's changing. Huh? Uh, more and more, we can see manifesto for post-materialist science and a lot of other initiatives which are very, very, you see, again, coming and confirming uh, what, what was written in the book already more than 160 years. Yeah. Talking about research in the initiatives, please tell us about uh, the Kardec portal, which is part of the uh, project from the Federal University of Juiz de Fora in Brazil. Uh, we, we found some uh, Kardec, uh, original document from Kardec, uh, something like 10 years ago in, in France. And there was a kind of a story which was told about this famous Canuto Abreu, a Brazilian researcher who came to France and who has uh, somewhere uh, gathered uh, several hundreds of original documents. And that was hidden in, in you know, <laughs> uh, by his uh, successors and so on. And in, it was in 2018, uh, of a sudden, I got the information, hey, they, they look uh, on, on, on the internet, there are some uh, original documents from Kardec to sell. So since I had already some that we found in France in hands, I could recognize immediately that indeed it was original documents from Kardec. And uh, luckily I could uh, contact uh, the person. He accepted me to come to, to, to his uh, house and to scan these documents before they were uh, sold. So <laughs> I took holidays the next day, I went there, and in two days I scanned something like 3,000 or more pictures, <laughs> and uh, just in order not to lose them. And as a synchronicity, the same year, huh, the descendants of uh, Canuto Abreu also decided 
uh, to open uh, and to put available to the, to the public uh, these uh, 700 documents uh, his uh, grandfather uh, has uh, gathered uh, when he was in France at the beginning of the 20th century. So really something happened. And there were also some discussions about some uh, changes in the genesis, in the heaven and hell and so on. And, and all these things somehow happened together. And today I'm really very happy to see that uh, uh, I could meet all these people uh, in 2019 when I was in Sao Paulo. I could meet uh, the, the, the people from uh, CEDOR, uh, Federação Espírita André Luis, huh? who, who were uh, having this document. I could see what they were doing, cleaning, hygienizing putting into the, the X-rays uh, uh, radio radiotherapy to kill the, 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 the degradation of the papers and so on. So really something fantastic and a huge work also for high definition images and transcriptions and so on. And I'm even more lucky, uh, happy today to see that uh, a federal university, uh, the University of uh, Juiz de Fora in Brazil, managed to gather uh, several tens of very high skilled uh, people, uh, university teachers uh, and so on, uh, around the project to create a, a portal, uh, this uh, Projeto Alan Kardec, uh, which so it is called, where uh, all these documents will uh, at the end be gathered and put being made available to everyone. But I, I just would like to say, uh, be careful it's, it's, I tell you, 3,000 documents in total. So it's a lot, a lot. Imagine transcriptions, translations, scanning, and so on. But it's going, I would say, in a, in a very good uh, shape, collaboratively, uh, uh, open to everyone, and so on. I hope it will continue like this. And uh, because here again, spiritism does not fear any fact, nothing. Spiritism is also always uh, with the truth. Let's face the thing, how they really were. And uh, so far, what we have learned from all these documents is uh, it, it gives even more strength and more admirations for what happened uh, for the different actors uh, which were there to see what went well, what went wrong. And it's a huge, huge, huge learning for a lot of people uh, today. So I'm really very excited to see how it goes on. There is so far only 100 documents, but I hope that the 2,900 others will uh, follow now very soon and quickly. And Umberto, you're part of that project as well, aren't you? Yes, um, I'm part of the staff of the project, and I have been working with Kardec Original Text for about two years now, and it uh, it's quite exciting uh, to know uh, about the personal life of such an iconic character. Uh, he is the most read, the greatest French author in Brazil uh, from all centuries, from all uh, parts of history. Uh, even if uh, Victor Hugo or now uh, Teilhard de Chardin. Michel Foucault, Bourdieu, Voltaire, they are all very uh, appreciated, but we have to sum a bunch of these great names to compare to the massive size of Kardec books, uh, editions in, in Brazil. Uh, it is really a, a cultural phenomena and a social phenomena. We have a, a problem here because most people believe that spiritism is a form of religion or an organized religion, uh, which is false. But uh, this perception is one of the main challenges that we face in this project, because we are working from a public uh, university and we have to explain to people, to tell people again and again, that uh, Kardec is a cultural uh, happening. It, it, it's a, a cultural reality. It's a piece of our history of Brazilian uh, social, cultural, intellectual life. And uh, from that perspective, it is absolutely mandatory that we 
care about uh, his uh, documents and his regional letters, uh, diaries, um, uh, bills, whatever we we are getting from uh, this project. Yeah, I completely agree because it's so important for us to look at and respect the pathways that have taken place before us for us to get where we are. Now, talking about pathways, Dan, you've written a book called Our Road to Damascus, Seven Lessons for a Life of Purpose and Meaning. And I've got my copy right here. Please tell us about this book because I've read, read it and it's wonderful, but I want to hear from you. What? This thing over here that you're talking about? <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I just happened to have it handy here. Um, <laughs> now, thank you. Thank you for the space. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's some musings and some, uh, it's, it's a, really a symbolic interpretation of a story that um, has been placed within the religious sense, right? Which is uh, the adventures of Paul the Apostle as he goes from Jerusalem to uh, Damascus. And historically, we have always seen that as an organized religion moment, right? And what I try to do here is to rescue that from that dogmatic thinking and say, wow, no, this is really is a story of personal transformation. Uh, because when we, we start to think about how to change our lives and improve ourselves, which spiritism always points us to, we start asking those questions, how can I do it? And so it was really the desire to look into perhaps one of the greatest, if not the greatest personal transformation we have on record in history and see what happened there and what are some of the lessons that we can take away from that. So um, so I, I draw seven. There's a lot more, but I, I try to make it easy and simple and palatable um, and not really uh, dive into the religious world, but more into the personal transformation piece and see what are some of the, the, the challenges and obstacles that we are likely to go through and what are some of the considerations that we might want to th- uh, you know, keep in mind, given the lessons that Paul has left us? So I'm really excited even to share today that I just got notified that he got a silver medal on an award, the Illumination Book Awards, which is really exciting. And of course, if folks are interested, I would be thrilled and honored to have your readership. Uh, it should be available anywhere uh, that you find books. Um, you know, in the UK, I think you can find it on Amazon. I think in, um, or is it Waterstone? I think you can also find in Waterstone and the like in the United States. Uh, you can find Amazon and elsewhere in Brazil. Some marinos over there as well. So, um, yeah, that's uh, thanks for the space. I appreciate it. I hope folks enjoy it. And uh, I know that I certainly enjoy spending some time thinking about this incredible and remarkable person, uh, Paul, and how he transformed himself to be a major thinking and a major influence in the world as we know today. Yeah, so that's Dr. Dan Assisi, Our Road to Damascus, Seven Lessons for a Life of Purpose and Meaning. And we'll put links both for the book and the Progetto Kardec portal in the description of this show. We want to invite everyone to come and help us with our High Five fundraising campaign, which is set up to help support two charities in Brazil who in turn support their local poor communities with the basic needs from housing and education to food and employment. A group of Spirita Shela in Salvador, Bahia and Instituto Multiorong in Curitiba, Paraná. And they are in need of our support, especially now during the pandemic. And we are accepting donations on their behalf. And it can be anything from a one-off contribution to a monthly donation and just five pounds per month, less than the cost of a coffee and a sandwich, will go a very long way to helping these groups. For more information about this, including how to donate, please visit kardec.org.uk slash high five, and that's spelt out H-I-G-H-F-I-V-E. And you can find the link of this in the description as well. Well, before we end, let's have a moment of positive reflection with Annie. Annie. What have you got for us today? Uh, I've got a, a little reading from this book called Living and Loving uh, by the Spiritual and Angelis uh, through the mediumship of Divaldo. And um, I casually opened it and it was interesting, chapter seven, it's called Ways to See. And it starts as, as like this. People see a landscape according to their own visual capacity. A colorblind person 
will have difficulties to dis distinguish the different hues. A short-sighted person will have a distorted perception of reality. Any deficiency or anomaly in the visual organs will result in an incorrect way of seeing. However, if a person has adapted himself or herself to a visual deficiency, they will never know that they have missed the delicate patterns rich in details in a picture or the exuberant colours life is bathed in. When we assume a task, when we take on a task, we should set ourselves a target and speed towards its achievement. We should neither stop, curse or complain, but move steadily on, consciously and with our responsibilities. The way we see or consider a fact results from our individual capacity for discernment. Place the lens of love over your personal deficiency and you will see life, people and things from a very different angle. Through the perfect colour prism, so rich in beauty, that you will work more as you strive to reach your target. So think about the ways you see and what lens you're putting over your eyes. Thank you so much. Well, on that note, that's it for this episode. So don't forget to contact us with your thoughts, your comments, your story submissions. And so it just leaves me to to give a big thank you again to our special guests, Charles Kempf and Dan Assisi, thank you so much. To thank my co-hosts, Annie Sinclair and Umberto Schubert. My name is Adam Osborne, and we hope you can join us again next time for another episode of Insightfully Speaking, looking at the world from a spiritist perspective.